Okay, yeah, today's very special. Uh, Pastor Taewon will be sharing the Word of God with us. But if we will all rise for the public reading of God's Holy Word, we'll be reading from the prophetic book of Nahum, just three verses, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It will be responsive. I'll read verse 1, you read verse 2. All together we'll read verse 3. I'm reading from the NIV. A prophecy concerning Nineveh. The book of the vision of Nahum, the El Koshite. And then his wrath against his enemies. All together. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and clouds are the dust of his feet. This is the word of the Lord. Give him a warm welcome as he comes up. A good afternoon. Uh, before we get into the message, that we're going to begin with a YouTube clip. So, please. The Book of the Prophet Name. This short prophetic book is a collection of poems announcing the downfall of one of Israel's worst oppressors, the ancient empire of Assyria, and its capital city, Nineveh. The Assyrians arose as one of the world's first great empires, and their expansion into Israel resulted in the total destruction and exile of the northern kingdom and its tribes. The Assyrian armies were violent and destructive on a scale that the world had never seen before. And so Israel and its neighbors were awaiting the downfall of Assyria, which eventually came in the year 612 BC. The Babylonians rose up and began a rebellion that overtook Nineveh and brought down the Assyrian Empire. And so chapter 2 depicts the fall of Nineveh in vivid poetry, and chapter 3 then explores the downfall of the empire as a whole. But this book isn't just an angry tirade against Israel's enemies. The introductory chapter shows us that there is way, way more going on here. The book opens with an incomplete alphabet poem that begins by describing a powerful appearance of God's glory. It's very similar to how the previous book, Micah, began and how the next book, Habakkuk, is going to conclude. And it's God, the all-powerful creator, coming to confront the nations and bring his justice on their evil. And the poem opens by quoting from the famous line of God's self-description after the golden calf incident in the book of Exodus chapter 34. The Lord is slow to anger. He's great in power. He won't leave evil unpunished. And so the rest of the poem goes back and forth, contrasting the fate of the arrogant, violent nations with the fate of God's faithful remnant. When God brings down all the arrogant empires, he will provide refuge for those who humble themselves before him. Now, here's what's really interesting, is that you thought this book was only about Assyria, but Nahum actually nowhere mentions Nineveh or Assyria in chapter 1. And when he describes the downfall of the bad guys, he uses Isaiah's language about the fall of Babylon, which happened much later in history. And not only that, Nahum also describes the downfall of the bad guys as good news for the remnant of God's people. It's a direct allusion to Isaiah's good news about the downfall of Babylon. And so all of these little details from chapter 1, they come together to make a key point. For Nahum, the fall of Nineveh is being presented as an example, as an image of how God is at work in history in every age. How he won't allow the arrogant or violent empires of our world to endure forever. And so the message of Nahum is actually very similar to that of Daniel. Assyria stands in a long line of violent empires throughout history. And Nineveh's fate is a memorial to God's commitment to bring down the violent and the arrogant in every age. With this perspective from the opening chapter, the book then returns to its focus on Assyria. And so chapter 2 describes the battle of Nineveh and the overthrow of the city in progressive stages. So first we see the front line of Babylonian soldiers, and then we read about the charge of the chariots, and then the chaos on the city walls as the city is breached, then the slaughter of Nineveh's people, then the plundering of the city. Chapter 3 goes on to describe the results of the city's downfall for the empire as a whole. So Nahum begins by announcing a woe upon the city whose kings built it with the blood of the innocent. 
is an image of how injustice was built into the very system that made Assyria so successful. But their violence has sown the seeds of their own destruction, and so Assyria will fall before Babylon. The book concludes with a taunt against the fallen king of Assyria. He's stricken with a fatal wound, and from among all the nations that he once oppressed, no one comes to help him. Rather, they sing and celebrate his destruction. And that's how the book ends. Now, this is a gloomy book, but it's important to see how Nahum's message addresses the tragic and perpetual cycles of human violence and oppression in every age. Human history is filled with tribes and nations elevating themselves and using violence to take what they want, resulting in the death of the innocent. And the book of Nahum uses Assyria and Babylon as examples to tell us that God is grieved and that he cares about the death of the innocent and that his goodness and his justice compel him to orchestrate the downfall of oppressive nations. And God's judgment on evil is good news, unless, of course, you happen to be in Assyria. Which brings us all the way back to the conclusion of that opening poem in chapter one, which tells us that the Lord is good and a refuge in the day of distress. He cares for those who take refuge in him. And so the little book of Nahum invites every reader to humble themselves before God's justice and to trust that in his time, he will bring down the oppressors of every time and place. And that's what the book of Nahum is all about. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful day to worship you with this group. We ask that you will strengthen us Restore us and inspire us with your love. Lord, we are here to worship you and listen to your word. Help us to be filled with your unconditional love and grace so that we will pour out your love and grace to others. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hello again, everyone. Hello. How's everybody? Doing good? How's your week? Good? Okay. Aren't you guys busy lately? Like a lot of work, you know, studies, homeworks. I'm sure, you know, many of you feel like, you know, each day goes by really fast. You know, some of you may be the process of getting used to, you know, a new school or like a new job. And some of you might be preparing, you know, hard for college or applying jobs. And some people are trying to make a stable life, having a you know, busy life. And some people are getting used to you know, the fast paced life that, that we are living through right now. And even for me, you know, I'm trying my best to get used to my new job and you know, responsibility here as a youth pastor. Even though that we have lived you know, busy lives, you know, we all of us, you know, we have chose to be here today and listen to the word of God. Now, this is something that people in the world, they don't do. Like those who do not know Christ, you know, they think of Sunday as a day to just hang out with their friends or people or to on a trip. You know, or something you know, special, they do something special for themselves on Sundays. However, whether you're here because you want to be here or somebody may you come here, but still the good thing is the fact is you're here. You know, that's very important that you're here. And I hope that you all are here with the right heart and be ready to, you know, take in the word of God and God will see that heart and be pleased with it. You know, I'm pretty sure that you know, God will please you know, he knows by our genuine act of worship to him. But I also know sometimes it's very hard and it's not easy to, you know, give 100% to God every single worship that we're attending and we go to. That's because we're not perfect. We're human. That's why we cannot give 100% to God all the time. You know, I know most of the times that we we genuinely praising the Lord and we trying our best to listen to sermon. I hope that's the case. And, but sometimes I, I even I admit that because we are physically too tired, 
Sometimes we cannot like focus on the worship, and we just we just cannot give you know our heart to this moment. And try to stay awake from a sermon, but it's hard because we're so tired. And sometimes when we are exhausted, we often think like, "Why am I here? You know, why why am I seeing this sermon?" And sometimes I feel like I just want to go home, you know. And sometimes if you're reading the Bible or listening to a sermon, you know, you may not fully understand what the Bible or the sermon means. And I'm not here to like, I'm not saying these things to like judge you guys, you know. But the fact is, even I'm saying myself and even like Pastor Charlie or other adults, you know, we go through these things sometimes too. We're not perfect, we're human, so we do the same thing. You know, if we listen to a sermon about a story that we are familiar with, you know, we become, you know, a little bit, you know, interested. But, however, it's normal to lose our attention to stories about the books in the Bible that we don't, we're not familiar with. Like today, we'll be discussing about the book of Nahum. Book of Nahum. You guys just saw, watch the, the video clip? But have you guys ever like heard of the book of Nahum before? Like, did you have an idea of the book of Nahum? Do you guys know what it's about before you watch the clip? Now, to be honest, before I started going to Bible college, I hardly knew anything about the book of Nahum. I mean, I knew a bit. The, the, the noun is in the Old Testament in the prophet, but that was it. I didn't know anything else. Isn't it like similar to you guys too? Right? Agree? Agree? Yeah. You know, the reality is that the book of Nehemiah is not well known. It's not familiar. And it's very common, you know, for the people that they don't know what it's about. So probably some of you may think that then, you know, how does the book of Nehemiah you know, in the Old Testament, it says B.C. like 631. That book, how that relate to my life in 20, 2022? And what can I learn from this book right now? Like really, like what can we learn? However, we need to know the book of Nahum is also an important book, just like all other like Bible. You know, God put the book of Nahum in the Bible because it is important. And He wants us to listen. He wants us to know, understand, hear the message from the book of Nahum. So today, we'll talk about, you know, what God is trying to tell us from the book of Nahum and how we should continue to live our lives through the teaching of the book. So there will be a two main points that we'll be discussing, it'll be on the bulletin too, you can follow with me. The first point is, God judges the people of Nineveh because of their sins. God judges the people of Nineveh because of their sins. When you hear the word Nineveh, the city of Nineveh, is there anything that pops into your head? Nineveh. Where did you guys hear Nineveh? There you go. Jonah. Yeah, there you go. The word of Nineveh, you know, obviously appear in the, in the book of Jonah. And, you know, the Jonah is, you know, the story of the, the big fish, and we know. The similar to the book of Jonah, you know, the book of Nahum is a story that proclaims to the people of Nineveh. To give, you know, to give a little background, the era of Nahum is about, known to be about 100, 150 years after the story of Jonah. And the story of Jonah tells us that you know, the people of Nineveh, they repented. They repented the warning of judgment from Jonah. But now in the book of Nahum, after 150 years later, you know, they, they're back. They're back to living in their own life and pride. And they no longer fear God, and they were living a life of destruction. Now, from the very beginning of the book of Nahum to the very end, 
the whole entire message is focused on the people of Nineveh and the destruction of Assyria. So we need to know, so what did they do wrong? You know, and what sins that did they fall into? We need to know that. It's very important to look into how the people of Nineveh, they turn away from the repentance to being warned of ju- judgment once again. As I mentioned earlier, Nineveh was the Assyrian capital. It was the capital of the Assyria. And history tells us that you know, the Assyria was a, one of the strongest you know, and most powerful countries in the era of the Nahum. So the city of Nineveh was, you know, they were protected by the solid walls and they celebrated the victories of a lot of battles. They were winning battles. So at the time, the Syria, you know, they had a power and influence that many countries wanted from themselves. You know, through the victory of the wars, the people of Nineveh, you know, they grew stronger and wealthier over time. Still, they, they, they took many people from other countries as captives and destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, at the time of the Nahum, the Israel was divided into two kingdoms. The one is the northern Israel, northern kingdom of Israel in the north, and the kingdom of Judah in the south. So the northern kingdom, the northern Israel was already destroyed by Assyria at the time of you know, Nahum. But the kingdom of Judah, they did not yet destroy by them yet. However, they were constantly attacked by them as well. You know, the people of Nineveh, they killed and tortured the people of Israel that God has chosen. So the book of Nahum proclaims that God will destroy Assyria, the people of Nineveh. In addition to the Nineveh taking people captive, they also continually tortured and killed innocent people, like the elders and children. And the reason why the city of Nineveh grew more evil over time is because they trust the kingdom that they built on their own. Their nation was built around a river, and they built tall and powerful walls as a protection. And they trusted their own strength. Because of that, they were winning the battles. So they were prideful about the fortress that they had made with their own manpower. Arrogant. And the pride grew bigger and bigger within the people of Nineveh. Now, there's something very clear that we can learn about through the evilness and pride of people of the Nineveh. During the time of Jonah, everyone, you know, including the, even the king of Nineveh, king of Assyria, they all repented. And they came back to God after listening to the word of God about their judgment. However, after 150 years later, in the book of Nahum, we see after 150 years of living in the prosperity, God slowly disappeared from being the center of their lives. In the bulletin, there is a, one Bible verse says, uh, Nahum 3.1. It says, O to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims. Now, though the culture and life of the city of Nineveh they develop over time. But at the same time, their morality fell. Murder, theft, and lies grew. And God's jealousy came upon them because of the sins that they have committed. But among all of these things, one of the biggest reasons for God's jealousy was idolatry from the people of Nineveh. Now, Nahum 1.14 says, The Lord has given a command concerning you, Nineveh. You have no descendants to bear your name. I will destroy the images and idols that are the temple of your God. I will prepare your grave, for you are vile. As I mentioned before, 
At the time of Jonah, the message of God's judgment came to the people of Nineveh because they fell into idolatry. And they received the opportunity not to be judged. However, after 150 years later, they turned away from God and came back to idolatry and served other things as their God. Now, one thing that God will not tolerate is idolatry. Now, looking at the beginning, beginning of the you know, Ten Commandments, we can see that how much God dislikes idolatry. The first, com- first commandment you know, in Exodus 3, uh, 23 saying, you shall have no other gods before me. The second commandment is, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heavens above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You know, God wants to give unconditional love to his chosen people. And he wants to pour abundant grace and blessing upon his children. But one thing that disrupts that is idolatry, idols in our lives. But just because we don't like have a figure of an image in, in our lives, like a, like a Ten Commandments in a state, but it does not mean that we're not participating in idolatry. If, if there is anything that in our lives that we love more than God, All of those things are idols. It can be yourself. It can be family. It can be friends. It can be school. It can be your studying. It can be your jobs. It can be your career. And the list can go on and on and on. And we just saw through the people of Nineveh, they begin to I mean, all kinds of evil sins when they began to love and trust things that they built with their own strength. Instead of you know, becoming more humble and thanking the Lord, you know, they, again, they turned to their old ways and became sinful. And we know the city of Nineveh faced judgment because of their sins. So what, what can we learn from this? These people of Nineveh, the book of Nahum. Now, just because we come out to the church every week and serve and do all thing, all these things that we think you know please the Lord, it doesn't mean that we'll be safe. No, it does not guarantee salvation. Anyone in here, anyone, can face judgment if God is no longer number one priority in your lives, in our lives. If we put ourselves before God, other things before God, like other idols before God, there will be judgment. So what should we do? As our lives become more prosperous and stable, as the things seems like it's working out in life, and as you see, continue on our lives, we need to be thankful and maintain humility. You know, God gives peace to those who trust in, trust in Him and believe in the salvation of our God. And God will be with those people and God will not leave them behind. So I pray and hope that you know, all of us here will reflect and reflect our lives and repent and give our idols to God. You know, let's become sons and daughters in the God that serves God and God only, God alone. And also our first main point was, you know, God judges the people of Nineveh that because of their sins. The second main point is God comforts his chosen people. God comforts his chosen people. So the name name Nahum, Nahum means comforter. You know, it means to comfort. And just like the, the prophet Naam's name, you know, God comfort his chosen people. And Naam 1, 3 says, The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. God makes sure 
than those who sin face judgment. But the Nam 1 7 says this The Lord is good, a refuge in times of troubles. He cares for those who trust in Him. So God takes care of and protects His people who trust in Him. So today, I, I want all of you to know that I'm not trying to like scare you guys, you know, about all these warnings and judgment day. You know, I'm not trying to scare you. But we can, we can see through, you know, the judgment of the people of Nineveh that what will happen that if we do not repent our sins and turn away from our Lord. So I hope that this message doesn't simply scare you what ends right here. Instead, I hope that we can all convicted of our own sins and become the people that live under the protection of our Lord. Our Lord. And that we all had no choice but to die, perish, because of our sins. However, God sent His one and only Son, Jesus to us. He sent His Son Jesus to save this world and to face judgment in place of all of us. And Jesus took took on all of our sins and sins of all, sins of the world and sins of both of you and me. And Jesus died and resurrected. You know, this shows how much you know, God, our Father, loves us and how, how much Jesus loves us too. Jesus, He who had no sin, had no reason to die, but He took all of our sins and chose to die for us, for you, and for me. And I don't know what love could be greater than all this. But in life, we often forget about God, you know, making excuse that we're busy. Or sometimes, you know, when our lives are going so smoothly, like, we forgot about God because we don't think we don't need Him anymore. Of course, all of us, you know, if I'm, tell me if I'm wrong, but we all like, you know, want to study hard, you know, to go to good school, good college, and want to, want to be succeed in life by getting a like, good job and living with a stability. And I'm not saying that any of this is wrong, you know, but I want all of us to think about one thing. I want us to think about whether God is still at the center of our lives when we're busy, when we are happy, when we are sad, when we are desperate, and when we are satisfied, and when we are stable. Now, the list can go on and on. We need to think about it. Now what, what the people of Nineveh did was wrong. But let's really think about it. Are we doing anything different right now compared to the people of Nineveh? Like, are we also turning to other things in this world and loving other things more than God? Are we trusting ourselves and relying on our own strength instead of trusting God? So we'll go ahead and close soon. But I just wanted to end with one more thing. You know, today we learn that the result of idolatry is judgment before God. So as we continue to live our lives, we need to trust in Him with a humble heart. But, but in reality, we sin every day. Like we sin every hour. Our lives are filled with sin because we're human, because we're not perfect. But God called us to be His sons and daughters. And He sent 
His Son Jesus Christ for us. Now, and He calls us that we are His children. And He poured out His unconditional love on us. Isn't it crazy to think that God cannot love you more than He is now because His love for you and me is already at its like maximum in every moment? His love never changes. And His love will continue beyond what we can imagine. I hope that all of you in your daily lives Remember this love, God's love, that is being poured out on you in every moment of your life. This week, now, I want all of you to think about you know, what it is that you trust and love you the most. Is it you, yourself? Is it your parents? Is it your friends, future, career? Is it God? You no, know, I pray that all of you will put God at the center of your lives and continue to seek God as the number one priority in your life. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we are here before you to listen to the word of God that you are trying to teach us today. Even though that it was so easy for us to sin every day and move away from the life that you desire for us. I pray that at this time today, we will give it all to you, God. Help us, Lord, to trust you as our God that takes care of us. Help us put you in the center of our lives and in every circumstance that we encounter. Be with us, Father God. And Lord, thank you for sending your son to die for us and showing your unconditional love for sinners like us. Help us to remember this love and to live a life that pleases you. God, thank you, Lord, you know, for this time. And I pray all this in the name of Jesus.